Good morning, and as that video just indicated, welcome, and I am so glad that you are here with us today to join us in this time of worship. Uh, today you can see we're uh, looping back to some things we did a couple of weeks ago, uh, putting on the clerical attire and uh, allowing those who uh, enjoy coming to our late service in particular uh, to have a little bit more of a normal look uh, as far as I'm concerned as I once again put on uh, the robe of a shepherd, uh, the stole of the prophet, and the cross that marks me as a Christian who's been baptized into the name of Jesus. I do hope that you enjoy this service from beginning to end. It's very special and specially made for you. I'd like to go ahead and take you right now into this uh, invocation as we begin our time of worship together. Though we are apart from one another, we nonetheless gather together in heart and mind and spirit to worship our God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, be present with us in this time of worship. Let your glory shine on us. Let your love surround us. Let your power fill us. Let your grace free us. Amen. And these words, which serve as a call to worship from Psalm 145. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all, and His tender mercies are over all His works. Say 
we are gathered and we make our beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, Bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And let us pray. Faithful God, whose mercies are new every morning, we humbly pray that you would look upon us with your mercy and to renew us by your Holy Spirit. Keep safe our going out and our coming in. And let your blessing remain upon us this day. Preserve us in your goodness and give us a portion in that eternal life which is ours in Jesus Christ our Lord. He lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit as one God, now and forever. Amen.
Our first reading comes from the book of the first letter of John, the fourth chapter, beginning at the seventh verse. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation of our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is so, also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel is taken from the sixth chapter of St. Luke beginning at the 27th verse. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive... What credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your father is merciful. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God, and praise be to Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the St. Mark's Kids Chat. We have some special guests with us today, Lucy and Mason, our cousins, who are here to um, do the Kids Chat with us today. So um, in Sunday school um, this week, you guys are going to be learning about um, an army commander named Naaman, um, and it's from 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. Um, and Naaman, he was a very well-respected man. Um, he was actually, um, but he also had something that's called leprosy. Do you guys know what that means? What does leprosy mean? You're itchy all the time. Itchy all the time. I know, exactly. And so sometimes it makes you die. And it can sometimes make you die. Yeah, it's a skin condition. Here's a picture of it right here. This is kind of a picture of what your skin might look like if you have leprosy. So it's kind of white and splotchy and itchy and it's super, super duper uncomfortable. Um, and he was kind of ready to be done with it. So, um, but you know, it was interesting. Um, in his house, he had a servant 
um, who was a helper for his wife, who came to him and lived in Israel previously. And she said to him, gosh, I wish my master would go to Israel to meet this prophet who could help um, cure his leprosy. So, um, you know, he, uh, Naaman, this guy right here, he went to his king and said, hey king, is it okay if I go to Israel and um, see this prophet that might be able to cure my leprosy? And his king said, totally go for it. And he gave him a lot of money. He gave him 10 talents of silver, which is equal to about $200,000, our money, our time. And then six shekels of gold, which is almost like $3 million in our time. So that's a lot of money. Ooh. So do you think that he might be trying to buy his skin condition to go away? What do you yeah. think? What do you think? Yeah. So he thought that maybe I had to just pay all this money to this prophet in order to do that. But we'll find out later that they actually didn't want his money. They wanted him just to be trusting in God. So, um, so he wrote, and also the, the king wrote him a letter um, to send to the other king of Israel saying, hey, here you go, here's a letter. Will you please, um, you know, take this, um, this money and will you please cure him? And the king was like, hey guys, I, I, don't, I don't cure anything. And he thought that it was like an act of war, but it actually turned out that um, Elisha sent a message to the king of Israel saying, hey, just send him over here my way and I'll, I'll help him out, okay? So he went and he saw Elisha, and let's, let's talk a little bit more about what happened when he went and saw Elisha. So we're gonna um, do a little demonstration. So if you guys wanna come on down here and have a seat, we are gonna talk about what happened. Max, you come on over here. <laughs> you stand right over here, okay? So, so um, what happened is that Elisha said, I want you to go to the Jordan River and I want you to dip yourself in it seven times. Okay, so what I'm gonna have you guys do, we have a little bit of toothpaste here. Will you guys put your hands out for a minute? And I'm gonna give you guys each a little bit of toothpaste. Don't wipe it on each other, but Ooh, put it on the tips of your fingers, rub it around, okay? Rub it around, and I'm. you guys are gonna pretend that this toothpaste, make sure to come in the frame, guys, so we, everybody can see you. Um, we're gonna pretend that this toothpaste is leprosy, okay? Yeah. So, so I wanna ask you something. How does it feel to have this stuff on your skin? Weird. It is actually, it weird? It actually feels like soap. It does kind of feel like soap. Like, yeah, it does smells it, weird. it smells weird. Does it feel uncomfortable? Yeah. yeah Would you be eager to get it off of your skin? What do you, you want to just keep it on? What if you had to have it on your skin for the rest of your life? How would you feel about that? I want to get it off. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so what would you be willing to do in order to get it off your skin? Anything. Anything. Okay, I'm, I'm going to hang on to those words, Lucy, okay? Anything. So come forward just a little bit so that you can stay in the frame. Um, so if you were to be willing to do anything to get that off of there, would you listen to somebody if they suggested for you to do something? Yes. Yeah, okay. So, but what if, you know, like Naaman, he, he was asked to go into the Jordan River, and the Jordan River is actually muddy, kind of like this, okay? So, if, if someone said that you could be cleansed of your leprosy if you go into this muddy river knowing that you're going to be covered in mud afterwards, would you do it? Uh, maybe. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe. Well, um, that's what Naaman was asked to do. And you know what? You know what? Um, Elisha said that that's what you needed to do. And what did Naaman do? He, he did it. No, he actually didn't at first. He got angry and he ran away and he said, I don't want to do that. And so he ran away. And, and then his servants came up to him and said, hey, Naaman, uh, wouldn't you be willing to do anything to get this off of your skin? And so they really encouraged him to go back and to um, dunk himself in the river. So that's what he did. So Naaman, you can see here, he washed himself in the Jordan River, okay? So I want you guys to do that, all right? Dunk yourself in this dirty water in here, Max. It feels very strange. It does it feel very strange? <laughs> all right, now Mason, you stick your hands in here. Max, you go to the side a little bit. Go to the side, go to the side. Dunk your hands in there. Cleanse yourself. Cleanse yourself, it just looks like Naaman did. Yeah, it's gross. Is it a little gross? Yeah. Well, here. All right. 
Dry, dry your hands. Each of you guys can have dry your hands with this. There you go. Take your hands out and dry them with this, what I'm handing you. There you go. Here, Sawyer. Dry your hands off. I know. Okay, dry your hands off and have a seat. It's all right if it doesn't get off all the way. Okay, so, but you know what, what happened is that as soon as he um, did what the prophet Elisha told him to do, um, as soon as he told the prophet, uh, what he did what he was supposed to do, guess what happened? <gasps> he was cleansed. Do you see this picture of him? He is praising God. He is praising God. And you know what he also said? He, um, he was, you know, he was hoping that Elisha would just wave a magic wand over his head and fix something for him, right? Yeah. But God doesn't work that way. God, you know, he gave Elisha, obviously, um, you know, a, a, the power to be able to probably do that to perform miracles. But you know what? God wanted to teach him a lesson in all of this, okay? God wanted to teach him a lesson. So he wanted to teach him a lesson of being humble, okay? What does humble mean? Um, humble means like you're... Um, being good you're being good or you're um, or you're doing something that maybe you maybe don't want to do but you do it anyway right like okay put someone first. like putting Instead someone else first exactly exactly so um, you know so he he was so humble do you see how excited and happy he is he was so humble that he actually went back to Elisha and he thanked him and he, um, he mentioned to him that he acknowledged that God was the only one that could have done that for him and that God was the only one true God out there. Because back then, other people, they worshiped other gods, right? And then he said to, to Elisha, he says that I will only worship the one true God. Don't okay? some people still worship other gods? They do. They do, exactly. So that's a good lesson for us to remember is that you know, us worshiping other gods and worshiping the money and all these other things that money. we put into God's... Yeah, because money... Sometimes people worship things like money or they worship... Anything that takes the place of God is basically something that um, could be, uh, you know, considered a god. So, um, so, yeah. Anyway, so yeah. What can you guys be doing this week that um, reminds you to be humble? Okay, so how can you be humble this week? Um, by putting someone first. By putting somebody else first, or maybe listening to somebody. Because look, did uh, did Elisha want to, or did um, Naaman want to listen to Elisha? No. no, he thought he knew better, right? So maybe listening to somebody that you maybe you normally wouldn't listen to as far as advice, but especially if there's someone who is um, filled with the Holy Spirit and who knows God well. All right, so be thinking about how you guys can do that this week. All right, bye guys. says it's a good thing to give thanks to the Lord. Amen. I come before you today And there's just one thing that I want to say
darkness and gave me your light. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You took my sin and my shame. You took my sickness and healed all my Grace, peace, and mercy be to you from God the Father and His Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This morning we are continuing our sermon series, Living in the Goodness of God, which is an in-depth study of Psalm 23. And today we are going to look deeply into and unpack the meaning of the first part of the sixth verse of this psalm. That verse reads, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Now the things that I share in this sermon this morning reflect the thinking and the writing of Philip Keller, 
who wrote a book titled, A Shepherd's Look at Psalm 23. And the key thought that I want to share with you this morning starts with three indisputable truths about God. They are indisputable because they are found in the veracious, veracious and infallible Word of God, the Bible, and they have proven themselves to be effectual and causal in the lives of those that he has made members of his church and part of his family, or as in the imagery of Psalm 23 would tell us, they are sheep who are in his care. Now, another way to say all that is that God has made clear promises to us that because of his nature and its inviolability uh, that cannot be broken uh, or infringed upon, we see his promises being played out unmistakably in the lives of his beloved children. Now, those three truths are these. Number one, that we have a God, a good shepherd who is good all the time and who is faithfully and wisely providing for all of our needs just at the right time. Number two, that we have in God a good shepherd who is in control over all things and he is working all things out together for our good and to his glory. And we have in God a good shepherd who bonded himself to us out of love and out of his own free will so that his good and merciful care will attend us all the days of our lives. We will live in with and under his goodness and mercy now and always. Now, today's key thought is this, that just as God's goodness and mercy shall flow into my life throughout all the days of my life, I have a calling and an opportunity to leave behind a legacy of sharing God's goodness and mercy with others throughout all my days. I want to share with you a uh, a little thought that I learned about sheep and about a legacy that they typically leave behind when they are under the care of a good shepherd. And I hope that you will not find this information to be discountenancing or that you will consider it frivolous. <laughs> I do have to say, I'll even warn you, that you may find it uh, something that will make you smile or even perhaps snicker about under your breath. You see, their legacy is that they were called in ancient times those of the golden hooves. The reason why is because they were regarded and esteemed so highly for their beneficial effects on the land. Now, what were those beneficial effects? Well, there were two of them in particular that sheep had upon the landscape. And they were, number one, their manure. I mean, I'm told that it is the best balance of any produced by a domestic animal or livestock. And when scattered efficiently over the pastures, it proves to be enormous benefit to the soil. Now take a look at this picture. Also, sheep have a habit of seeking the highest rise of ground where they like to rest. And this ensures that the fertility from the rich lowland soil below is redeposited on the less productive higher ground. But there's also a benefit, number two, that they leave upon the land. No other livestock will consume as wide a variety of herbage. Sheep eat all sorts of weeds and other undesirable plants 
that might otherwise invade a field and which other livestock will not eat. Take a look at this next picture. For example, they love the buds and tender tips of the thistle weed, which, if not controlled, can quickly become a most noxious weed. A tableland can become nothing but thistle. And when it happens that it's nothing but thistle, that situation is usually very damaging to the health of that tableland or that meadow. But bring on the sheep, and in a few years, a flock of well-managed sheep will clean up and restore a piece of ravaged landscape as no other creature on earth can do. <laughs> so sheep who are well managed by their shepherd and taken care of by a good shepherd, who are living under the goodness and mercy of that good shepherd, can leave behind something that is worthwhile, productive, beautiful, and beneficial to themselves, uh, to others, and even to their shepherd. Wherever sheep are led, they have potential of leaving behind a landscape of lush, fertile ground, which is also weed-free. So wherever sheep walk, they can leave behind a legacy of beauty and abundance. But the question that becomes rather pointedly at this point is this question. Do you and me, do I, you and I, do we leave behind a legacy of blessing and abundance shared with others in the landscape where we walk through life? Do we enrich the lives of our family, of our fellow church members, of our neighbors who live next door and across the street or with whom we work and play? Or those who are part of our community that sometimes we don't rub noses with very often? Are we the kind of people that leave a legacy of goodness and kindness, of abundance in the community where we live and walk? Do we rid the landscape around us uh, as we journey on through life of noxious attitudes, of anxieties, of nervousnesses and fears that are found in the lives of our neighbors and those in the world Things that also tear down our relationships with one another because the actions of others are sometimes not good and they are not sprouting out of godly love or Christ-like compassion. Do we go around the world weeding out those kinds of things that just do not contribute to the health and to the safety and to the peace and the welfare of our communities? Philip Keller, in his book that I mentioned earlier to you, tells the story of two friends uh, who were invited to stay at his home with he and his wife as they were passing through that uh, neck of the woods where he lives, and they were on their way to minister to some people in another country. They were going to be going to another community and in the name of Jesus, share with those people the goodness and the mercy of God. When their stay came to an end, they invited Philip to travel with them on the next leg of their journey, which he did. Uh, after several days on that leg, one of the men who was part of that little group realized that his hat was missing. And he was quite certain that he had left it back at the Keller's home. And so he asked Philip to somehow get in touch with his wife and to kindly find out that it was there and then be pleased to send it on ahead to where they would be and where he could get it in the coming days. Well, her letter of reply is one that Philip said he will never forget. This is what she said. I have combed the house from top to bottom and can find no trace of the hat. The only things those men left were their great blessings. Philip asks himself, is that the way people feel about me after I'm gone? 
And it's a good question to be thinking about for you and me and considering ourselves. Do we leave a trail of sadness or a trail of gladness when we leave a place? Is the memory of us in the minds of the people that uh, we have been with and which we have now left behind, does it cause them to say about us that we were people of goodness and mercy, of godliness, freely shared? In the book of Isaiah, chapter 52, verse 7, we read this verse. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace. You know, sometimes it is profitable for us to ask ourselves questions. You know, do I leave behind peace? Or rather, do I leave behind turmoil in the lives of others? Do I leave behind forgiveness instead of judgmentalism or separation? Do I leave behind kindness and generosity or malevolence and stinginess? Do I leave behind contentment or do I leave behind conflict and anxiousness? Do I leave behind seeds of joy or do I leave behind seeds of frustration and bitterness? Do I leave behind love, God's love, God's love for me, God's love for all people? For the child of God, the one who is under the shepherd's care, the one who is day by day receiving the pouring out of his divine goodness and mercy upon our lives, it is a very natural response for us to leave a legacy of hope and encouragement, of kindness and good shared, and of mercy having been extended. You know, I think about Jesus, who is full of goodness and mercy like no other who has ever walked this landscape of our planet. His legacy was one time summed up with some simple, straightforward words in a pointed statement. It's recorded in the book of Acts, and St. Peter was the one who spoke it about him. He said to the people, Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit and power and went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. His great reason for walking the landscape of our earth, of course, was to be our Savior, to redeem each of us and bring us to be members of his flock. At great cost, he purchased us and made us his very own. And without merit or worthiness on our part, he continues to lavish upon us his goodness and mercy. And yet with that, and so much more, it was as though the loftiest, noblest, most important thing that he could do during his few short years of ministering to people was to do good for the benefit of others. He looked upon sinners with compassion and sought to set them free. He looked upon those full of faults and gave them forgiveness. He looked upon those who were weak and who couldn't change or adapt or get things done in their lives and he gave them his divine strength and empowerment so that they could meet their needs. He befriended the lonely. He shared compassion and companionship with the outcast. He never crossed the barriers of race, ethnicity, or social, religious differences because for him those things didn't exist. There were no barriers as such. He was above all that. He never looked at people or life that way because he valued all people. He shared compassion and kindness with all people. He taught and demonstrated that God values and loves all people. Every soul that God has ever created is precious in his sight and precious in the sight of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
the men and women and boys and girls who experience firsthand that kind of goodness and mercy upon their own lives will be the ones who become warm and affectionate and extend goodness and mercy out into the lives of others. That's just the way it is. We will simply be acting like sheep who have had all their needs met day by day, who enjoy the goodness and mercy of a God who is a good shepherd, attending to us all the days of our lives, and leave the landscape where we have walked with a legacy of having walked that landscape, sharing goodness and mercy, that of God, with others in the world. We'll be rich in grace and abundant in giving out kindness. And we will make the landscape more beautiful because of our lingering love that remains even after we're gone. And we will leave behind the aroma of Christ in all of His redeeming, restoring power. You know, nothing pleases the Lord, who is our Good Shepherd, more than seeing us as His flock flourish under His care and be sustained by His goodness and mercy. He loves it when He sees us sustained that way. And when He sees us also as sheep who are becoming more and more like His Son, Jesus, He also then would see our love and our gratitude being returned to Him for the way that He first loved us as we would bring that love to be born upon others. And all of this brings him great pleasure and gives him great glory. Even as David sang many years ago in Psalm 23, God's goodness and mercy is lavished on you so that it follows you all the days of your life, that is our Good Shepherd's legacy. May it become yours and mine as well, as we pass it on, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. And may his peace, his love, his goodness and mercy given, which is beyond our human capacity to fully understand, nonetheless create faith and sustain faith in the Lord Jesus Christ unto life everlasting, amen. We now will take the opportunity to join our hearts and minds together in making confession of our Christian faith in the words of the ancient creed. For generation upon generation, these words have been spoken as a testimony of the Christian's life to what he believed and who he believed in, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Join me as we speak these words. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In the wake of a crisis, people are confused and lost. Many have lost their jobs, loved ones, and ultimately, they have lost faith. People need others right now, and they are willing to hear others. Within a state of confusion, others need to hear a message of hope. We can take a bold step and share the love of Jesus. We must not forget what the gospel means. It literally translates as good news. And what better news to hear than the most powerful story in history? 
a story that tells us our lives have meaning, and that we find hope in today with one simple message. Redemption is possible. It all begins when we reach out to those around us. In your boldness, the church will be stronger than ever, for we are stronger together. Let us now pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all according to their need. Blessed Shepherd, you established your church with your sacrificial death and mighty resurrection. Grant us devotion that we may abide in the teaching of the apostles and honor the fellowship of the church. Guard us against all enemies of your word and keep us within the care of your flock. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Mighty Shepherd, you hold in your hands all the might of man, and you hold accountable those who would govern your people. Grant to us good government and good leaders who will honor your purpose, protect your people, serve the cause of justice, and defend our liberties against all threats. Give them wisdom and the will to do what is good for all with regard to all that are troubled and challenged. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O loving shepherd, you love the world enough to shed your blood, and you desire that all would be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. Inspire and equip us to speak faithfully and boldly your word and the gospel testimony so that many will be caught up in the net of your saving work. Strengthen and protect us that we may in the time of persecution have faith and even in the time of suffering do so for your name's sake and for your good and glory. Give us strength, O Lord, to be obedient to your word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And O oh, mighty, merciful shepherd, your wounds are our healing, and your voice calls us to come to you in the time of our need. Hear us on behalf of those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, who grieve those whom they love and whom they've lost, and to whom death draws near. We pray especially for those that we name now before you in our hearts quietly or silently. And we pray that you will grant them healing according to your will, your goodness, your mercy, 
and give them grace to sustain them in the time of their trouble, giving them hope and newness of life as they think about how you have reserved a place in the perfection of heaven for them. Be with the unemployed and the distraught. Return to them health and livelihood. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O giving shepherd, you have not withheld anything from us, but emptied yourself fully upon the cross that we would have salvation. Move our hearts to such devotion and teach us to be living with such generosity that we may serve our neighbor in the world in the time of their need using the resources that you have supplied to us in abundance. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And finally, O great shepherd, we pray that you will hear us, your sheep, answering all of our prayers, giving from your storehouse of goodness and mercy, granting us those things that are profitable for us and are good for our salvation and keeping from us all things that are harmful. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands we commend these for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now according to his promise, and as he has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Bless we the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his countenance and give you his peace. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.